So, as I said, you have history and prehistory. The only way we can discover prehistory is archaeology. Now, if I'm going too quick, our people can kind of follow me just to shout over me, please. So, this is the north side of the mountain. You have the church of the summit, and you see this little pathway here, and you have a little green place here, right? Just study that. That's a very steep slope. So, the next picture will show you that there's a little cave in it, that slope. This is Bob of the Riggs Cave. In 1836, Caesar Otway wrote a travel book about the comet. And in it he wrote about Bob of the Riggs, he says he was a flax comer from the north of Ireland, and that Bob was the boy for doing the penance for others. So it was a full-time career for Bob for doing the penance for others. So people would pay him the money, they wouldn't have to go up in their bare feet. And it seemed to be just as good that Bob could do it for you. But Bob, in the summertime, would live in this cave. So when we get in a closer shot, you see the size of the cave. But it's on a very, very steep slope. Bob expressed the wish that when he died, that he would like to be buried on the top of Crowpantry. And as luck would have it for us as historians, Bob, uh, Bob died in 1839. He was duly brought to the summit of the reef. Quite a few travel books have recorded his burial. And he is marked to the ordinance map. So if you look closely at the ordinance map on the summit, you will see Bob's grave. It's outside the perimeter um, wall on the summit of the mountain. So, after studying the mountain, we realised that Patrick just didn't come to any place. They had to come to an important place. And we know that all of Patrick's major conquests were important sites in Ireland. So the very first place he went to was the Hill of Tara, and of course he um, lit, lit the Paschal Flame. And many other sites were important sites. So this was an important pagan site. But of course, the only way we can find out about it is to do, do archaeology. So in 1995, uh, we employed a team of eight people, and they climbed the mountain every day. So some people say, I've climbed it once in my life. <laughs> they used to leave at 8 a.m. in the morning, climb up, do a day's work. And we got lucky. On the second day of doing a trench dig, we came across this collapse of stones. Now, this is no just normal set of stones. You can see how each of them are linked in. Yeah, you, you see the shape. So if you have a stone wall and it falls down, it's going to fall down at each side, a part of the original wall will stay in place. So what they, as they were moving on, this is maybe two weeks after the day, so you see over hundreds of years, the sort of rubbish and the soil, which are going up there, they have a, they have a doorway found at this stage here, and they're digging into the church. Inside that doorway, you see you have a perfect uh, stone here, which is the entrance, and you have two post holes. So there was probably a door there that were held up by very ancient posts. And you can see they have a perfect circle going around there to hold the mm -hmm. posts. And so this is a stunning find. And this was all found within the first three weeks of an archaeological day. So it proved to us that our hunch about the place was that Patrick didn't come to any mountain. He came to the mountain. So, just to give you a sense of where it is, this is the trick point on top of the mountain. This is the church that was found and the doorway is facing the east, which is, un which is unusual. It should normally face the west, but, but the weather, of course, comes from the west here, so they probably had a practical reason for facing the doorway this way. St. Patrick's bed is here, Lava Porrick, and St. Patrick's church is here. So, St. Patrick's bed, we would feel, is in the site of the previous church, which is Chapel Forrick. So you have St. Patrick's Oratory, Chapel Forrick was a church here, so there was no mention of Patrick Bed previous to 1880. So somebody in the early 1900s, when they knocked down the old church, decided they would put in Lava Porrick. For 200 years before that, the main relic on the summit of the mountain was Gloom Forrick, Patrick's knee, and they had a rock that had the indent of a knee, obviously a large knee, uh, but that is not found anymore. So this just gives you a sense of where you are. Clube is out on the north side and Clare Island is to the west. Mm. This is a very extensive building. I think if, if you assume that this man is five foot eight or five foot ten, that's quite a wall. Part of it is dug down into the ground and part of it is over the ground. And you will see later on that the roof was made of stone 
So when the building collapsed, it filled itself. So it, so it did became flat ground again. We know for a fact there are quite a number of other buildings. When you apply for an archaeological license, there is a theory that you should, you should dig as little as you can because they believe that technology will move on and x-ray type machines will come in, it, in the future. So they prefer to leave what's there as there. But this was, a, this was a particularly important find. And I'm just going to check my reference here to the size of this. This is the actual building. You see, see the doorway and you see it in front of the church. This was a 30 foot by, by 18 foot. There, there were so you can imagine if, if, if this is up at 6 foot, when this collapses, it fills the interior of the building and there's no need to clear, clear the building after that. So that is why the building has gone and survived there for hundreds of years. Let's go back. You see the blue plastic here? Mm -hmm. They obviously had a fire inside the building. So we were able to carbon date the ashes here. And the mm -hmm. carbon dating comes from the 5th century AD to the 8th century AD. Mm -hmm. We know that Patrick, we believe, was there in the year 441, in the 5th century, or sorry, the 5th century, yes. So this was built either very early on after his visit or maybe maybe sometime after his visit. But you can see by the quality of the of the work on the walls that it's this was this was well built. The problem is if we left it open, people were taking relics. They thought these were stones of Patrick and we came up one morning and about six of these stones were gone. So unfortunately we had to line it all with big plastic sheets and fill it back in. But we have enough Photographs and measurements. Uh, so th this is still on the summit, but you cannot see it, which is a shame, really. But people start to take it. <coughs> the other part of archaeology of the summit is we know that early pre-Christian and early Christian religious and ritual sites were always enclosed by an enclosing wall. And as I say, you can see this from the air. So you can see this pile of stones going around here. But Jerry Bracken's shot, which Jerry took about 35 years ago, he was a pilot of some repute, Frank, I would say, and he used to be flying the plane and taking photographs at the same time. <laughs> anyway, so Jerry survived to tell the tale. But this is the most stunning shot in the snow, because you will see all these stone circles. And these are all cut sites. You see them here? And there's, there's at least 30 perfect circular hut sites on the summit of the mountain. What is particularly unusual about them is they're all facing north and west, which is the exposed side of the mountain. But we know also down in Mount Brandon, it's the same thing. Now, people were obviously wanted to face the sea for whatever reason. But you can see there's an extensive wall going around here. So in this corner, they did a small dig just go to the day. That's what they found in that corner. So part of the original wall and the face of the wall is retained. And the theory from the archaeologist, and I'm not an archaeologist, is that you had a face of the wall and you had a dump rampart on the other side. So, so you had a slope of stones. And, and that, would, that would have given a stronger wall with the winds. So you have a, a bank of stones going around the side. Underneath this corner were found a blue beads and these were given to an archaeologist uh, and these were dated, I'm just going to get the exact date, the 5th century BC to the 2nd century AD and they were of Roman origin. So we can conclude that a person with Roman jewellery was on that mountain a minimum of 300 years before Patrick and probably 1000 years before Patrick and the beads were lost or broken and the wall collapsed in on top of them. Mm. So. In, in, in summary, we know that we have an early Christian church, we know that we have a pre-Christian uh, enclosing wall, we know it was an important ritual site, and we know that people were going up there <coughs> from far and wide. This, this is one of, one of the hut sites, Michael Gibbons, the archaeologist, is on the right hand side. Now, there are three, three set alignments of the sun. The first one I want to talk about is there is a belief that when Patrick came west, all his travels were coming along here 
and going off along the route. But that he was following an equinox, or he was following said, a journey that followed the equinox. Now we know we have an alignment with the sun, with the winter solstice here. So there are two men up in Drahada, and they have written a, they have written a very large book of Ireland called Ireland of the Setting Sun. And their theory is that when Patrick came to, to, uh, came here to Minmount, that he followed numerous important sites, but in a straight line going across. We know that from Crohan, even in the even in the early ordnance maps, there's a route in a straight line east-west called Tohokwarik. And about 25 years ago, Father Fahi from Ballantober Abbey organized a scheme to go and investigate this route. And parts of the route were still in existence, and other parts were still on the ordnance map. But what he found was a landscape littered with archaeology, old monasteries, churches, and later on we will come to St. Patrick's Chair, which is the only rock art site in Connacht. It's extensively, it's, it's got numerous cup and ring marks. So, whether this is true or not, this David Theory and this <coughs> other the pages in the book claiming that this is the case. Okay, but just to go and back up their theory that the alignment of the sun to ancient man was very important. If you were coming out, say, in January and about to plant your harvest, you could get an awful shock, say, maybe February time. If you were planting your harvest in March, you could still have snow in April. So the timing was very important. So what they knew 3,000 years ago, they knew the shortest day of the year, so they could count forward from the shortest day of the year. Earlier on, I mentioned Anuk, and this is a fabulous landscape. This is a sacred ritual site, which is very unusual. It has got three enclosing walls here. And you see the four stones which are in line here. These line up with the sun, the setting sun, on the 21st of December. Now RTE, every year, go to Newgrange about the rising sun. And nobody in RTE knows that the setting sun is equally important. Of course, you get the rising sun on the east of the country, and you get the setting sun in the west. This, this <laughs> site to ancient man was a most pivotal site. We have a circle of stones here. You can see, see some of them. But there's a perfect circle of stones, which on the Ordnance Map of 1839 is recorded. But of course, peat grows. And this peat say, is growing up all of the time. But it's, it's a very exposed site. When you get a spring tide, the whole area is covered in water. And if ever Bertra is breached, which is the main beach further west, I would, you know, I would fear for the site. This is a huge archaeological site with standing stones. Hmm. So, of course, the 21st of December is winter time. I went out there one of the days, and um, it doesn't line up the rock or the sun with the peak of the reek. Ancient man would have seen the landscape. They just didn't see the sun of the mountain. The whole landscape was a sacred ritual site. So you have a little notch up in the corner here, and it's there that the sun sets in on the 21st of December, the shortest day of the year, at 20 to 2, and it happens every year. Without fail. Okay. So this is it, lining up, and just before it sets, it's very bright because you're facing it. Now, the third say, alignment of the sun is on the other side of the mountain, which is the rock of Bohe. Okay. This was discovered by Jerry Bracken, not the rock, but the alignment of the sun was discovered by Jerry in 1989. And the reason why is this site here, you see lots of cup and ring marks, and there's hundreds of them on this site. This site um, was recently owned by Don Gibbons and the County Council has, has bought the site which is which is really good news. So it's a bit protected. This is the there are numerous rock art sites in County Mead, up in Armagh, places like this, but this is the only rock art site in Connacht and it's got extensive rock art on it. So Jerry reckoned there must be some reason for this. So he studied it and he soon realized that at certain times of the year the sun which uh, the sun will roll down Kirkpatrick. So Kirkpatrick is five miles west of this. And during April of each year, and August of each year, I'm just trying to find the exact date, it's on the 18th of April, mm -hmm. and the 24th of August, the sun lines up. Now, what Jerry also discovered is there's, 100, there's 122 days from the 18th of April to the 24th of August. There's another 122 days to the 21st of December. So it splits the year into three parts, not four parts. 
So we see the four spring, autumn, winter, summer. So he, he was very, very impressed by this. Why was there 122 days between each part of this? So I was out on a foreign trip, and there was a book written about the pyramids in Egypt, and a man had written a book about the setting sun rolling down the pyramids and the seasons, three seasons, not four seasons. And of course, when you think about it, the three seasons are important. You plant in April, you harvest in August, and you need to know the shortest day of the year. It, it wasn't necessary for ancient rural man to have four seasons. And also in Scotland, it's also known there is a, uh, there's a culture up there of having three seasons. Now what happens, this is, this is the, our, our work, so you, you always see it better when it's raining, because it takes the shape of the rock. <coughs> and this is just getting ready for the setting sun. But of course, as you know, when you face the sun, everything in front of you goes dark. This is the amazing thing about this. So you have a full sun, you can see all the fields and walls. But the minute the sun sets on the top of this mountain, everything on this side of the mountain suddenly goes dark. And it takes 16 minutes, but the angle of the setting sun is the same angle as the edge of Cropatry. And it takes 16 minutes from the summit to the end. So this is, this is Jerry's shot. And he exposed this film four times to get this one. And this is, this is obviously another shot that's been exposed three times. It is a phenomenal sight to see. You don't have to be there on exactly the uh, 18th of April or the 24th of August, you know, because you can keep on moving to a few feet each day. So, so you can see this sight certainly for three weeks in April and three weeks in August. But nobody really knows what it's about. But we know that it's there. And we know that the... Rock of Bohair, which is also known as St. Patrick's Chair, is connected to Pro Patrick. Another important site, which I mentioned earlier, was the Tower of Warwick. St. Patrick's Chair is just here. These, these are the Bohair locks. And this is the Tower of Warwick, which we believe is the ancient pilgrim path that St. Patrick used in coming from Ahagawa. Uh, Morris Abbey was founded in the 1400s, and because you had an abbey, they probably took over the organisation of the pilgrimage. Uh, but, as I said, this route, although it might not, might not have been used that much in the last few hundred years, <coughs> you see there's still a very clear path going across the mountain. The Morris route joins it here at this point. Hmm. 